I'm Robert Lefevre, I'm the director of the Promise Recovery Centre. What we're hoping to do with these short clips is to help people to understand the nature of addiction and what can be done about it. Eating disorders. People imagine that eating disorders are different from other addictions. They're not. They're, they're simply a way of changing the way we feel. Some people will use alcohol, some people will use drugs, some people will use food. And some people will use various addictive behaviours in association with alcohol or drugs, and some people will use various addictive behaviours in association with food. So every addiction has its um, substance and its behaviour. And we have to look at both and we have to deal with both. Uh, as far as the eating disorder is concerned, the substances that are addictive are the things that make us crave. They're the things that press the more button that says more, 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 more. That's what we're in trouble with. Not the things that are fattening. The things that make us crave. And therefore, they are just as bad for people at the anorexic end of the spectrum as at the bulimic middle or at the compulsive overeating end. So anything that makes us crave will terrify someone who's anorexic and will send somebody off into a binge at the other end, either bulimia or compulsive overeating. So the substances that do cause cravings are sugar and the refined carbohydrates, the white flour. They are purified drugs for people who have eating disorders. So, as you may know, it takes a kilogram of beetroot to make one teaspoonful of sugar. So in its natural state, it's quite difficult to eat a kilogram of beetroot. But it's dead easy for any of us to put one teaspoonful of sugar in and stir it up. But if you imagine back in the raw, trying to eat a whole kilogram of beetroot every time you wanted a teaspoonful of sugar, you'd realise that the body has its own natural defence mechanism against us overeating. We get filled up on the fibre. But once we purify it and make it into a pure drug, we're doing exactly the same as distilling potatoes into whiskey or using any other drug that we refine to take away all the extra bits so that we can get the pure hit. Well, that's what sugar does and that's what the white flour does. I don't know that there's any scientific evidence at any time for any form of addictive behaviour. Um, we're way in, in, in the early stages of understanding the scientific basis of addiction. So the things that I say about eating disorders are based much more on experience of treating over a thousand people here with eating disorders than it is on any scientific basis. Because if you listen to patients, you will get their anecdotal evidence. Well, if you listen to one patient, okay, fair enough, it may be so or maybe not. If you listen to a thousand of them, you've got a much stronger feel. But it still is only a feel rather than something that you can actually look at brain biochemistry and study exactly what's happening with the serotonin, the dopamine, the noradrenaline, the GABA and the various other neurotransmitters. We're a long way short of being able to do that. The cost of doing that type of, of fundamental scientific research is just prohibitive, particularly for a, a small treatment centre. Uh, but even for a major pharmaceutical company, um, it would be mega bucks. So the things that I'm saying are much more based upon an epidemiological basis. And what we find here at Promise is that if we take people off the sugar and white flour, then they don't crave. And they find that they can manage to cope much better with the challenges of, of daily meals. Um, the next thing we need to do is to have normal portion sizes. I will tend to look at my wife's plate and if I find there's some emotional change happening in me as a result of looking at her plate, then I know I've probably taken too much. If I'm saying, you know, how on earth could she survive on something as small as that? You know, then I probably need to swap plates with her and eat the portion that she chose rather than the portion that I chose, which might be a mountain. Um, and I need to be careful to avoid extra things like added salt um, because, again, I can, I can dampen my taste buds so that I, I then can, you know, stimulate uh, them to, to, to really crave via the salt. So there are all sorts of things like that. And I, read, I need three regular meals a day rather than constant snacking throughout the day. 
I find that I have to limit my meal times. Now this is all epidemiological stuff that we learn from each other. And I learned from people who taught me, from, you know, in uh, Overeaters Anonymous and other you know, treatment centres like Promise. And I brought these ideas over to the UK in 1986 um, in order to try to help other people who had eating disorders, same as I do. Now, the end result of that is nowadays I don't crave, nowadays my weight stays the same, nowadays I'm actually able to sit down at a meal and enjoy it rather than feel that it's a major challenge or feel that, you know, I've got to um, eat for England rather than just eat, you know, just for hunger. Um, in recovery, I discovered what hunger is. I didn't know before that. I used to eat because it was there. Or I would eat because I was upset about something. But I never ate because I was hungry, because I didn't allow myself to be hungry. My secretary said to me once, do you realise you've just eaten my lunch? I didn't know that. I would see a patient, then I'd go to the fridge and take something, and then I'd see another patient, I'd go to the fridge, then I'd go to the patient, I'd go to the fridge. I went straight through the fridge from left to right, straight through her lunch. Now that's pretty humiliating. At other times, I would, you know, binge and starve and all the rest of it. My weight used to vary 50 pounds up and down. The most weight I've ever lost was two stone in three weeks, when I was on an absolute deliberate starve. Nowadays, none of that changes. So I don't know what the scientific basis is, but what I do know is that in practice, the ideas that I was shown actually work, as though that's what matters for me. And I share these ideas with other people in the hope that they might work for them. If they do, hallelujah. If they don't, okay, let me know if there's a better one, because I'd be very interested. But I think we're a long way short of finding any scientific evidence. And people who want scientific evidence um, can, can wait for it if they wish. But I personally would rather give it a go for myself and for, for other patients with eating disorders so that we can get a chance of getting well while we can. Um, I'm running out of time. Um, I need to get well. My mum never did. My mum never changed. Uh, she was five foot naught and about 15 stone. And I think it would have been nice if she'd been able to have the opportunities that I've had.